Okay, brilliant. Well, I'll get started. Um, welcome everybody to this inaugural event of the um, Climate Emergency Week. Um, thank you so much for um, you know, taking time out of your busy schedules um, to, to be here. Um, it's obviously, you know, the, the term's really kicked off and I hope first years are feeling thoroughly welcomed by now, but um, this is certainly a sort of justifiable way to spend a, what is quite a gloomy uh, afternoon in London, I hope. And um, obviously these three events are gonna be part of a series um, thinking very much about this important issue of climate emergency. And we hope that if you're not able to join, as you know, say at lunchtime tomorrow for the film session that you might rejoin us again for the round table on Friday afternoon evening, um, that we'll discuss some of the kind of bigger picture questions that emerge from these um, these discussions about you know literature and film today and tomorrow um so the big picture questions in a way to just frame frame the topic are you know how how does art and narrative shape the way that we understand and react to the climate emergency and what role do arts and humanities students you have to play in shaping the future of the livable planet um and we're sort of um eagerly uh you know, eagerly thinking of uh, this generation as one who have been uh, formed in the sort of influential school climate strikes and have, have been, you know, coming of age in this moment of, of rebellion um, against extinction, which has been a really exciting time to be alive. And in many ways, you know, we have to keep learning the lessons from activism and, and, and feeding these back into the loop of research and thinking um, so that we really, you know, effectively work together to move forward on what is the kind of one of the defining issues of our of our time if not the defining issue um, and in some cases I would say it can seem difficult to marry the study of literature or the watching of David Attenborough documentaries with this kind of real world action that needs to happen but on the other hand you know na narrative in many different forms is absolutely central to this effort we'll be thinking about how narrative can be effective in terms of its form content distribution and as a sort of form of a call to action not just shaping the way that we understand the problem and challenges but also the way that we engage with them in in sort of the in the, in in the world um, day to day and of course, today we look at literature and specifically a contemporary author who privileges um, narratives set in the past as well as the present and future to cast a, a new light on the historic dimensions to this challenge. It's interesting to note that movements precisely like Extinction Rebellion also take special care to historicize the climate emergency because they believe that inequality, environmental destruction, gender oppression, colonial and post-colonial conditions, modernity, nationalism, and racism are all intimately intertwined. And I think that's also evident when we look closely at this text and hopefully the sort of resonances from the previous weeks of gender sexuality and um, the matter of black lives will also continue to reverberate through this theme. So just to flag up that tomorrow at lunchtime, we do move into the visual form with a screening of two short films that will be included in the session itself, um, chaired by Dr. Debbie Martin, a film scholar from the Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies. And we'll be thinking about how images and film can sort of differently and similarly illuminate aspects of the climate emergency and further impact our understanding and engagement. And as I said, on Friday afternoon, as the sort of cherry on top, um, Flori and I will be back um, joined by lots of other special guests from across UCL um, to discuss how UCL works with this topic on multiple different levels in both practical ways through UCL sustainability um, in dialogue with the U UN sustainability development goals. Um, Simon Knowles will be talking about that big project and also looking at uh, talking to an ex-student of both Florian and mine um, who came through our two modules in you know as an arts and humanities student like you and has gone on to do an MSc in environmental governance at Oxford and we'll be talking about how you know just a pathway through the arts and humanities can lead to further further study in this area and not necessarily in the arts and humanities but you know uh, she'll have always have that background to bring to bear on this kind of um, approach uh, to environmental governance going forward as well which is really exciting to think about. So I would just like to kind of ask our two other panelists to introduce themselves now. Obviously, we have the eminent professor of comparative literature and Italian studies, um, Florian Musnig, who um, is looking very humble, but really is a, an absolute expert in our midst. He's published things very recently that are very relevant to this, um, this question, including um, most recently um, a, a piece on um, oceanic futures, dystopia after lockdown, uh, 
questions such as um, articles, sorry, such as species at war, the animal and the Anthropocene, an introduction to a, um, a paragraph volume, in including the title, you know, rethinking the animal human relation, all eminently relevant. So Florian, if you wouldn't mind, you know, um, introducing yourself and as well as your interest in this area and what you're kind of working on, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I realize this is going against alphabetical order and sort of any order of uh, courtesy that I've been taught when I was a child, but so apologies, Liz, but it's really nice to be here. Thank you so much, Emily, for organizing this and uh, for organizing the whole week. And it's, it, as always, it's a real pleasure to, to be part of your team. And uh, I, I won't say very much just to, to say, as, as Emily has, as kindly explained, I do work on this. Like in the Ian here, um, we are at the moment for the first time teaching a course together on um, world global literature and the Anthropocene. Um, so it's very much part of our rethinking of um, of our. Um, of our own trajectories and part of our rethinking of comparative literature as a discipline. In, in terms of my own research, I think actually it's probably true to say that to an extent the climate crisis and that sense of emergency is caught up with me as it has with many of us because I've been working on narratives of catastrophe and on apocalyptic fiction for, for a while now, initially focusing on the Cold War period. And it's just, you know, for obvious and good reasons, a lot of the more contemporary work now is broadly cli-fi or anyway informed by that kind of sort of sense of urgency. So my own attention has shifted as I'm trying to keep up with all this kind of sort of extraordinarily momentous kind of shift in, in, in wider attention, so which, which this is part of. So, so, so really looking forward to our discussions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And I was just going in, in the order in which Zoom has presented your faces. So that was the, the rationale there. But um, yeah, so next to welcome our eminent um, PhD student and PGTA from the Spanish of, um, sorry, Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies, Liz Chan. And Liz Chan is also a very um, sort of expert in our midst. who's actually working on, um, you know, exploring narratives uh, in, in the particularly in the Patagonia region. So Liz, if you wouldn't mind also telling us a bit about your uh, research background and, and how actually these explorer narratives have, have really you know, allowed you to see, see some things in this it's text that, um, that might have escaped those of us who are not um, experts in that, that dimension of history. Yeah, thank you very much, Emily, for that introduction. And I would like to echo and say that I'm a really big fan of Florian's work <laughs> in the animal studies realm in particular. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm um, I'm working on historical representations of Patagonia, particularly questions of landscape, environmental history, and how humans, both in indigenous um, and external to the Americas context have understood and represented this landscape. So I'm really interested in questions of exploration history, um, which resonates a lot with what we're going to be looking at here today. Um, so many of the broader and important questions that Emily's already flagged up figure very importantly in my research. I'm really, um, I'm really interested in how and why we've understood certain spaces in certain ways at certain points in history and how those narratives have fed into our current relationship with the natural world and the point of crisis at which particularly we find ourselves right now. So really looking forward to getting into some more of those questions a bit more deeply with you all. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, so I'll just, um, I'll share a, a few slides with you now to present the author. Um, Obviously, it's um, an author you may not be familiar with, depending on your kind of language area or you know your time um, specialism. Um, so hopefully, you can see this now. Yeah. So Polo um was born in 1977 in Argentina and is a and studied um, sort of philosophy at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, she has been sort of distinguished as an up and coming. Uh, Latin American author who's been, you know, featured in the Granta um, 
best young novelists of Latin America, as well as um, obtaining a pre prestigious creative writing scholarship to the University of Iowa, and has become a kind of intellectual commentator of her time. Her first book, um, The Savage Detect, uh, sorry, The Savage Theories, um, provoked a huge controversy in Argentina, um, in, in, including sort of big debates about the nature of um, writing and the kind of the role of of the women in speaking out against you know um in in, in contributing sort of hist historical and sociological and political debates in that country and um she often you know satirically said you know the, the reason why i'm receiving such backlash is because i'm a woman talking about things that they don't think i should be talking about and so she's you know even in this space um wh where we feel that we're moving forward in gender equality she's kind of having to really do um do some fierce battles in in that context and her work really is starting to kind of have an impact. She's been writing um, uh, sort of regular columns in Argentine newspapers, as well as contributing articles to um, the New York Times and other you know, global publications. So it's worth mentioning that this particular text, the exhibition, um, the, sorry, <laughs> the expedition, um, is actually the opening sort of sequence to um, her second novel, The Dark Constellations. Um, it's, it's, there are a few differences and it would be interesting to kind of see the way, um, compare the way in which um, the text evolved as it was sort of supplanted into this novel space and some of the names were changed and some of the details differ and it's actually quite interesting to compare those two things. But I would kind of flag up the novel itself, it's an absolutely fascinating um, sort of introduction to a history, present and possible future of um, the kind of climate emergency. A uh, sort of ecological unconscious and a, an implicit theme as well, in a way that lots of different levels at which this is engaging with this question. So it's a kind of constellation of ideas that involve this exploration of power and knowledge in the shadows, not necessarily in the light. Um, the idea of Foucault's biopower and his periodizations of the move from the classic to the modern era feel very relevant when we're looking at this time frame of the sort of 1800s um, and these, you know, basically explorers, botanists, naturalists, and their effort of classification moving into a more kind of biological space going forward in, in the novel as well. And, and the implications of this in terms of the kind of plant, animal, human, technological continuum that is traced through the novel itself as it goes into a sort of protagonist who's a hacker in the 80s, all the way through to his journey to being a kind of you know, facilitating biopower at the deepest genetic level in the in the near future in 2025. So if you are interested in this um, text and, and seeing how it evolves, then I really would recommend that novel. And obviously I've flagged up some of the other names that help to think through and theorize this plant, animal, human technological continuum. Um, people like the philosopher of science, Donna Haraway, um, Ling Margulis and Rosie Bray Dotty as well. Um, a sort of partner, companion partners to um, thinking through some of these ideas. And then finally, before we kind of attend to the questions and go into breakout groups to talk about these ideas further, I just wanted to frame with a couple more quotations. So the first one is this, the very idea of nature, which so many hold dear, will have to wither away in an ecological state of human society. So this is Timothy Morton, a uh, sort of a eco literary critic and, and, and thinker from the US, from Rice University, who's written a, an excellent book, which I recommend, Ecology Without Nature. And he's talking about how the very idea of nature will have to wither away in an ecological state of human society. And the kind of premise behind this is the idea that if we keep thinking of ourselves as humans and, you know, with our culture over here and nature and the environment as separate over there, we are never going to kind of um, find our way out of this, uh, this emergency which we find ourselves in. And the second quotation is, is from our, you know, our good old friend Karl Marx, who knew this, you know, and, and there's a sort of a whole trend of eco-criticism that's revising and, and building upon his work, this, this quote that man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature means simply that nature is linked to itself, for man is part of nature. So always an ever sort of useful reminder of precisely that phenomenon that people are still having to kind of spell out today. And so I think it's really helpful, hopefully, to sort of think through these these um, these framing ideas when we when when we think about this text and the representation of, of landscape and humans in it um, or their interactions with it. 
And finally, I just wanted to signal forward as well to the roundtable. Lucy Bollington will be with us to present her edited, co-edited volume, uh, which is the book published uh, last year with University of Florida Press, um, Latin American Culture and the Limits of the Human. And I think many of the kind of themes and topics that emerge in that are also eminently relevant today. And one quotation that stood out at me was, Texts such as this, um, I find, you know, help to explore the fragility of the human colonial project and the, and the human psyche when confronted with objects, animals and people who challenge a prior sense of the order of things. And I feel like we're still always coming up against a sort of a, a resistance and a, and a sort of prior sense of the order of things that, um, that we're not managing to sort of um, productively overcome. So this is just a, an image to kind of break up um, and get our heads into this Famara crater, the landscape of uh, what is modern day Lanzarote. Lanzarote probably today has different connotations than, um, than the sort of representation we see. But here we have a, an image of that kind of monolithic skyline, the black sand and the undulating kind of dark rocks. Um, so we can start to imagine that sense of arrival and this um, otherwise seemingly unpopulated landscape. And the questions I've picked out that we can start to think about in more depth in the breakout groups um, are, you know, what do you notice about the representation of the island? How do the explorers interact with that landscape? How does a Jarac frame or reframe exploration narratives from the 18th and 19th centuries? Um, what is the take on science here? And in particular, the scientific and sexual legacy of Leopold Brun. What do we make of the fertility ritual to which the explorers are submitted? And is there a contemporary relevance to the story? Is there anything that particularly resonates for you, you know, or resonated for you when you read it with um, the current epoch? So with that, um, I think we're ready to sort of split off um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know some of you and uh, others will be in the capable hands of Florian and Liz for the breakout groups. It must be a kind of conscious choice to stage a sort of British imperial encounter than rather than the American encounter, you know, the Spanish um, arriving to say Patagonia or anything like that. But um, yeah, it's yeah. I agree with you that it sort of does feel like a no space as well. Um, I, I think there was a there was a sense also in the proper names. We didn't really manage to discuss this, uh, but it's it's something which which I think is relevant that the proper names are both, you know, intriguingly specific and somehow not really, they don't really offer us any further insight into what's happening. So they could be, t they could be tokens of kind of, um, you know, um, a, a, you know, narcissism of minor difference in a kind of sort of what is clearly an expedition led by, by, um, by kind of sort of the global north, if you wish, which is the universal level. But at the same time, they look like they might be, um, that like they might contain much more relevant points if only we could decode them properly, you know, in, in terms of the specific points, specific reference to specific historical characters and specific reference points to specific, you know, historical junctures as well, with, you know, how particular countries foster their own approach to, to this kind of sort of big um, colonial endeavor and, and were particularly prominent at the, at, uh, in relation to scientific exploration or in relation to, to military expeditions or capitalist exploitation. So I think that, that was the same question, yes. Yeah, definitely. And I, I've honestly, having written about the novel version of this, I've delved into the sort of internet um, sort of possibilities of these names a lot and never really come up with anything meaningful. But it's interesting to note that Leopold changes to Nicholas. Um, so both, yeah, sort of um, Nicholas Brun in the, in the novel. And um, there's no seeming, you know, they're just kind of leads. I'm sure that you could go to archives in Holland and you'd find good records there, but I haven't managed to get the funding for that yet. So um, they remain shrouded in some amount of mystery. <laughs> um, but perhaps we should, I think on this point, it's perfect to go over to Liz because she does have more of a kind of historical 
uh, reference point in terms of explorer narratives so um, and has already illuminated some of the historic parallels that um, went over my heads when I, I've had conversations with her about this so you know Liz that and also what, what how did the discussion evolve in your group um, so yeah I was quite I was reminded when I read this initially it made me think of the of Johann and Jörg Forster who were the naturalist on Cook's second expedition who the Forster Jr. Jörg was was really young when he went on the expedition I think he was 17 um, and that sort of image of a Germanic naturalist perhaps might be, have been drawing on on those kinds of narratives um, but I mean Cavendish as well stood out to me as there was um, Thomas Cavendish was a was an English circumnavigator who circumnavigated in the 17th century and it, it evoked for me this image of a kind of old retired um, wealthy um, naturalist or explorer financing these further expeditions in a kind of cyclical way. Um, in terms of what we actually talked about, we, we discussed as well, we started off by talking about that sort of feeling of being overcome or overwhelmed. And I think it was Sarah who was in my group who said that it was, it reminded her of the spidery flowers um, sort of creeping over you, um, <laughs> which I thought was a really nice way of summarizing it. Um, and we also talked a lot about, I mean, this was quite, I think our discussion was based on some of those comments that I made quite historically situated. And we talked a lot about the, the temporal frame of this, because although obviously we don't have a specific date, it is, um, it is um, eight, um, 19th century. And this is the moment obviously where science is starting to become more institutionalized in different ways. We talked a lot about the emergence of geology as a discipline and how it underpins a lot of what we're seeing here and how the focus on volcanoes is really interesting because this was, if we're talking about the early 19th century, this is a time when geology is starting to be much better understood and volcanic eruptions are a really important area of study at the Royal Geographical Society and things like that and this still would have been a really mysterious landscape for the for the average man sailor probably on this kind of expedition most of them would probably never get to see a volcano so um, yeah we talked about that a lot we also talked about the kind of conflict of different epistemologies that we see taking place here of different ways of understanding and interacting with the natural world like you have the moment where they they eat the white butterflies and they're sucking out their insides and obviously that's a really barbaric act to Brun and his crew whereas obviously that's um a ritualized but important and in many ways normal act for the indigenous inhabitants of this island and so the conflicts of those kinds of ways of understanding and interacting with the natural world were were really important in our discussion and obviously those we were just saying at the end resonate a lot now in terms of how how many of our relationships have been founded on these kinds of extractive practices that have been hiding behind the guise of science we were discussing what what is the aim of science here what is the scientific aim is there even a scientific aim is it purely exploitative because at the beginning it's just bumbling around in a cave um so <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that was a pretty good summary of what we what we went through. But if anyone in my group wants to add anything further to any of that, please, please feel free to chime in. Hello. Um, yeah, so we talked about the idea of empiricism and the notion of you know the nature the explorers coming onto a, an island which they've never seen before. And, and how they want to um, potentially civilize these, these uh, the natives um, on the island. But at the same time, they do not foresee the idea that they themselves could be enchanted by this island um, through this ritual um, fertility act and through the, the visceral acts of, of drinking coconut milk and, and extra extracting the, the very nature before their eyes. And I think it was really fascinating um, to me because the way the author describes the text is, is so immersive and it's so unique the way that it's been written. Um, I think it is a testament to the idea of testimonies, you know, what do we choose to record and, and what is the impact on, on science in the aftermath?
Yeah, brilliant. That's that's a really good reflection. Kind of thinking, of, uh, and then who who has the who has the say, and and whose whose um, remembrances are actually documented as well. Oh, Keshin, um, sorry, Kexin has to leave. Sorry to um, see you go before. Yeah, we... I've got another event going on. Sorry, guys, I have to leave. No early. problem. I'll um I'll mention your future novel, so you have to send us <laughs> a link to that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, guys. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go on to kind of uh, resume, um, well, to sort of um, but, but continue to digest and, and, and speak through how, how my group got on. We also talked about some similar qualities, the kind of very unsettling introduction and the, the way in which we're me meant to sort of, we're almost overwhelmed with these details, many of which do feel like a, a classic kind of narration of landscape. Um, and many of which kind of jar us out of that and make us want to find out, well, what is Christia Pallida? What is the Guanche sect? Um, and just on, on Liz's point then, I just thought it's funny to imagine that actually this story could be being told by the Guanche, you know, they're, they're, it could be the record of them. It's, there's a kind of funny moment in the second page when it says the, stories of the, the story of these visitors is known to the belief system of the Guanche sect of Mahan. And so it's as if, you know, this, this story could be being told in a way from either perspective and that mysterious Guanche um, figure that pops up and, and is informing the telegraph of its vastly contradictory sort of um, assessments of this expedition, you know, is what's going on there? Is it actually that we are looking for the sort of details in all of the wrong places and that we're actually supposed to be thinking about it precisely from the other, other side, um, the, the other way around? But no, we talked about that kind of initial um, landscape um, and uh, Kexin was saying she's also writing a kind of um, novel. So she was thinking very much about this tone and the kind of, in her, her case, it's an encyclopedic tone. So appropriating the kinds of tones and, and detail giving of science, but at the same time, very much undermining the empiricism of that process and their eyes are confusing them and they're seeing, you know, they're not sure what they're seeing at any given time and they're kind of, so their sound is also they're misrecognizing things and they're very much actually disorientated rather than um sort of adequately using the scientific process to gain knowledge um at, at, at the start um and yeah um on my other kind of the member of the group um Shirai was very good at uh, sort of separating out the the language from the tone and and what we're supposed to read it on two different levels so the detail versus the tone of the narrator so we started to speak about that in, in relation specifically to the fertility um ritual and thinking you know how are we supposed to interpret this um it's Firstly, we talked about how it is it foreshadowed in that linguistic description of the landscape. Are we supposed to be reading in the undulating, you know, rolling hills, the kind of female form that so often is um, the the touch point of these kind of um, narratives? And and obviously, we spoke about that. I, I hear that some others of you have spoken about that too. But and then that sort of it seems to foreshadow this. Um, hypersexualized ritual and we talked about you know is that a hyper orientalized female other that um is is being taken to its sort of extreme and and and, and sure i was identifying the kind of sarcasm and the fact that it's taken to a, a sort of hyperbolic extreme um that that is part of the way that we're supposed to read that perhaps you know um other than it being a sort of male fantasy of the explorer who gets incorporated you know into this fertility ritual with the native women um here it gets to you know it, it goes so far as to be producing blood and that they're completely exhausted and almost you know um seemingly unconscious and it is it's it's a very kind of satirical engagement with the kind of um anthropological ethnographic or explorer fantasy that m might be might be present um yeah and then we also talked about, I think that the same topic of the kind of universality or specificity of the encounter with the natives itself. And again, talking about the, the calm and smiling natives and, and the idea that they may or may not have agency agency and control and that they are the ones who kind of initiate the encounter and they lead the explorers to the central cave of the grotto. Is that, are we supposed to take that they are, you know, they are in control and they're, they're um, it's different in that sense to, to other 
representations that we might have of that in staged encounter where you know it's more the kind of fearful native but um iris pointed out that it's in fact it's it is the same it falls into the same trap as many of those narratives in that we have the absolute hyper professionalized and individualized members of the crew um that have their specific kind of roles within that and versus the kind of you know the the natives that are all just one group like a kind of completely homogenous group no names no personal even the women when they approach the men for the fertility ritual are in groups of two or three there's no individualization of the natives whatsoever um so in that sense the representation is very much the same as as many that we we see and sort of problematize um from those explorer narratives so so yeah, I think that was um, sort of broadly speaking a few different contributions. Did anyone from my group want to say a bit more, anything I might have missed? Um, Iris or Shirai? To be honest, I think you got, you got everything. But like, I just, I just, I found it very interesting all the points in terms of our club, um, what everybody else has been saying about um, that idea of, you know, like science, uh, I think it was Sarah saying this, the idea of science representing like, an objective representation of the world but at the same time that it gets colored by the perception you're bringing and the objects that you choose and then eventually uh, it, just, it just seems very cool i thought what this piece was doing with scientific vocabulary and then therefore the the impression that that's supposed to give a reader and then how the how that's being sort of manipulated to do things that it otherwise doesn't um and i think that came out from what everyone's kind of said I think just the, the overall effects of that were very interesting. I've never really thought of it that way before. So, um, yeah, just food for thought, really. Yeah, brilliant. And and worth saying that we have a sort of diverse set of participants as well. Um, Shuri is doing an MA in philosophy, so is looking to do a kind of um, future module on sustainability and, and questions of, or sorry, the philosophy of the Anthropocene and things like that. And um, we also had an arts and sciences student in Iris and um, and and uh, Kesham, Keshin was in um Kesin was in fine arts so we had a real mixture um I, I think of participants bringing different things to sort of bear on the on the story um so to kind of I suppose round off is is there any kind of contemporary relevance then do we think to the story why is Aloysia that writing you know about this encounter now is there anything that we do take to bring us into the kind of present moment um if we think of this as an intervention. Emily, I'm, I was just going to, to ask you about the, the past, present, future structure of the novel, actually, because that seems to be such, a, such a, a, an increasingly common format now um, and such a sort of a popular way of writing, especially um, about, you know, uh, slow violence and, um, exploitation and also climate change of course and um in the in the under in the second year course which which hans convenes we talked about um questions of scale and sort of the need to think um you know to develop multi-scalar perspectives that we sort of think of the the past and the present and the future because it's the actions of the past which have a direct impact on our well-being and our responsibility is for future generations. So, so I was, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying not to answer your question at all, but I was wondering whether actually the relevance is very, is very different in the, in the context of that sort of uh, structure of, in, of that triptych, as it were, whether, whether the story in itself is, is kind of a, you know, whether it's difficult to read the story. I know the story was published prior to the book, but um, it's difficult for me to read the story and to answer your question about relevance without now fixating on the fact that it exists as part of a triptych. Yeah, definitely. No, that's a def definitely relevant kind of and uh, and justified response, really. It's, I mean, it it's great. The, what I would say is the, the, the cross crossover point and the way it evolves is that there's, all these instances of hybridity misrecognition between plants, animals, humans, geology, that, that, that this concept of hybridity is what brings, brings us forward. There's even a question at the end of that um, 
section of the novel that um, Nicholas Brun, or as he's called Leopold, um, ends up abusing of Chrissy Apalida, which is obviously this no un undiscovered na narcotic and, and really just goes off uh, to be a sort of raving, um, you know, wanderer in a way, and never fulfills his botanist sort of um, potential in a way. And, um, and yet his body is seemingly altered by this process because it becomes one of these special sort of hybrid specimens that is kept in this museum and, and, and undergoes further investigation. And that takes us sort of across into this moment of the, the, the 80s when there's a hacker called Cassio, who's already the sort of the, the human named after the calculator kind of watch uh, figure is that that cyborg figure comes into play. And he's um, also, you know, attentive to all these hybrids that have been suppressed over time, really. And in some ways, it's a sort of re recasting of the history of evolution itself. You know, Darwin's evolution was a, a kind of gradualist competitive model versus the, the symbio symbiosis of kind of fast, rapid in evolutional changes that can happen when a parasite enters you and completely reconfigures your, your biology and things like that. So it's very much um, a kind of rethinking of the history of evolution through that moment up into the, the present and, and the near future. And then the way it evolves is to think about, I suppose, the near future of biopower. Um, for example, there's a thought experiment, which is not too far from removed from the future, which is about um, genetic kind of, it's called, they're called bio, um, they're basically bio noses, they're called bio noses, and they're like these sensors on lampposts that just harvest genetic information so that whereas now we have our kind of passports and increasingly, you know, we have our iris scans at the passport control and, and we have our credit cards that leave a trace, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, we're sort of biopolitically tracked by governments as it is, but this would be one step further, it would be that these genetic things would be able to literally figure out where I am at any given moment in time because it's constantly taking our data. But at the same time, that stages this very important fact, which is that the human body is only 10% human DNA and the rest is all this other myriad of, you know, protozoas, kind of bacterias and other things that are non-human that mean that even if you were harvesting our genetic material, you would never be able to biopolitically track our location in that way. So it sort of introduces a, a, a question of resistance to that sort of control and that, that we can potentially escape um, the, uh, the sort of state and multinational obsession with knowing where we are at every given moment and kind of tracking us. So that's interesting to think about with the current moment as well and the biopolitical structures that are increasingly putting their tentacles into us in this new era of the pandemic, I think. I don't know if that sort of answers your question again, but it's that's the sort of trajectory of the novel. Um, that sort of connects a bit with, sorry, um, with because the obsession with the guanches has been there was this 2017 like genome study right I was kind of trying to read about them because they've sort of puzzled anthropologists because they were sort of white and light haired um and and yeah the, the, I wonder whether just thinking about the sort of universal versus the local this specific choice of the guanches about which uh, about whom you know so so little was was known and there's this obsession with genetics um yeah, I don't know if you if, if you researched more about that, Emily, or because uh, I guess the importance of race in climate and ecological movements um, is is something that's that's relevant to the contemporary moment. Yeah, brilliant. No, I'm definitely going to go and research that further now. That sounds absolutely fasc fascinating. You know that this this particular community is is uh, is also defined the kind of stereotypical um, racialization of the of the natives and the and those those types of encounters. So you're all helping me because obviously I'm going to wildly uh, uh, re-edit my chapter after this and, and, <laughs> and write a whole new article based on all of your input. But that's that's really fascinating to know as well. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the question, of, yeah, the, I suppose that's how we would bring the question of race through. And, and in, in many ways, I think there is a, a kind of attempt to sort of transcend you know the the focus on on venus that we haven't really talked about but there's a there's a sort of punctuated attention to the trajectory of venus across the sky that comes through the novel at different parts and obviously we have it here and there is a kind of effort to like re reworld the world if you see what i mean to re 
cosm cosmological, you know, we're all united by these planetary movements. And yet we as humans create all these divisions between us and, and the non-human, us and, you know, other races, uh, us and them in any different form that that takes. And um, and so I think there is a sort of underlying rewelding of the world that is going on here as well through that attempt, attention to planetary planetary movements. Um, and worth saying that the Dark Constellations, which is the title of the novel, is precisely the way in which the Incas um, conceive of the constellations. So instead of, you know, our constellations, which are, or, you know, I keep saying us and them as if, you know, it's, it's sad to have to use this language, but anyway, I'm trying not to other the, the others, but anyway, the Incas, um, instead of looking at the individual stars, which in the light of sort of astrology is, you know, let's look at these brightest stars because they must be the most important, like the individual of all of us in Western thinking is the most important. Um, they actually look at the gaps between the stars and it's in the gaps between the stars that they observe animals and figures that they then attribute symbolic meaning to. And so if you think it's actually a much deeper and richer and more accurate sort of vision of the, sc of the sky is to, to pay attention to the gaps between stars rather than the, the individual, you know, stellar um, sort of bright, figures so that's another theme that comes through is the the knowledge being in the dark the knowledge being in the places we, we were never looking for it um in the interstices and again in the digital sphere that goes into the sort of the backdrop to all these interfaces that we connect with now as well um you know so no it's fascinating um to think and I hope we haven't focused too much on the no on, no on the novel and moved away too much from the, the story but I think it's sort of you're right that in some ways it feels incomplete and it doesn't sort of necessarily give us much for the present perhaps in, in and of itself. Um, Hans had a, on the Venus point Hans you had that maybe um, that article you mentioned um, sounded really interesting and um, the city of Hartman. Yeah I just yesterday I read this text uh, yeah i won't show the light is too strong um which is better for my complexion um but um the text is by saidia hartman uh, venus in two acts um and it is about black women on the slave during the slave trade who were sometimes called venus or they were given all of these kinds of exotic names um, and how, so she talks about how in the archive of the slave trade or the Atlantic slave trade, how they only are registered in these moments of violence, of torture, of rape, or of fantasy, right? Or the, so the same sort of idea that is present in the story about how these women are sort of seducing um, the explorers is present in the archive as well. And so that's the... I don't know if this Venus connects to the Venus up in the sky, um, but um, yeah, but that's a task I, I gladly give to you. And we well, it, does, it does connect now, right? We've just we've just made that connection if it didn't exist before. And so there we go. Yeah, that's a brilliant another point of reference. Thank you so much. The only other thing I, I suppose slavery is something that we haven't spoken about explicitly back in the group and it is relevant and the fact that Cavendish is is the Duke of Cavendish which is you know is a confusing um, kind of slippage as it is because for example William Cavendish this was the seventh Duke of Devonshire. The Cavendish kind of family are the Duke of Devonshire or there's a Cavendish line that are the Duke of um, Newcastle upon Tyne. So um, what the implication is, I suppose we can read into, you know, Cavendish is a, is a famous um, scientist whose laboratories are still, you know, in Cambridge are still named after him, this Cavendish laboratory. So um, the implication is that science does have this kind of, you know, underlying tie to slavery that not only did it use slaves for its kind of expeditionary, um, the expeditions were often in the name of finding um, slaves during the time of the slave trade, indeed funded by the profits from slavery of, of British and other European sort of slave and landowners and things. So there's, a, there's you know, there's, that's another re re very relevant kind of point to think about um, and look into and, and sort of follow, follow up on. Um, 
Brilliant. Well, we are coming to the end of the time and it's been absolutely brilliant to speak to you all about this. And um, I, I've i learned so much from all of you, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think we will continue to do so over the coming days. So if you are at all interested in sort of thinking through now how contemporary film, fil experimental film that, you know, actually deals with um, the kind of climate emergency from a few different sort of perspectives in terms of weather events and the human costs and the human engagement with that and as, as well as this sort of deep ocean the question of deep oceans and 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 um, ocean ch change uh, then that that will be what we're looking at tomorrow and it will be very different it will be a kind of more experimental kind of narrative that we're engaging with um, thank you so much for coming today and I really look forward to seeing you throughout the rest of the week.